Nonetheless, I think it can be observed in history and experience that some individuals seem to be placed in sacrificial positions. Situations or tasks that, for perfection of solution, demand powers beyond their utmost limits, even beyond all possible limits for an incarnate creature in a physical world, in which a body may be destroyed or so maimed that it affects the mind and will. Hey everyone, Yoist in here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth, and happy Tolkien Reading Day to you all. Today we are looking at some of the greatest sacrifices and acts of service from the Lord of the Rings, as that is this year's theme for Tolkien Reading Day, set by the Tolkien Society. It is difficult to quantify sacrifices in a way where you can really rank them, so this list isn't really in any order, but these are all certainly different types of important sacrifices within the tale. Related sources are in the description and cards, while most of this comes directly from the books. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. First, we have a sacrifice that came as one of the first acts of service and sacrifice to my mind when thinking about this topic at large. Boromir's sacrifice on Merry and Pippin's behalf. After attempting to take the ring from Frodo, Boromir decided to keep these two hobbits safe as they searched for Frodo. Then came the orcs and Urukai of Isengard, and Boromir fought with all of his strength to defend the hobbits who, in this situation, were vastly outnumbered by their enemies. Not knowing what the servants of the White Hand wished to do with the hobbits, Boromir denied many of them, slaying Uruk after Uruk in the defense of those who could not defend themselves. Ultimately, as we know, Boromir was mortally wounded, pierced by many arrows, and his wish of saving the hobbits from capture was denied. But he conquered that day, as Aragorn put it, and atoned for any evils he had committed against Frodo earlier. But he would never have a chance to apologize directly to Frodo for his own deeds. This was, in my mind, one of the greatest sacrifices not only in The Lord of the Rings, but all of Tolkien's works at large. Boromir was the proud son of Gondor, the next in line for the stewardship of Minas Tirith, and he would have been the steward of Aragorn once the king returned to the throne. He was the High Warden of the White City, and perhaps the strongest warrior that Gondor could offer. Yet, just as Gondor itself was meant to serve as the bulwark of the West, against the shadow in the East, Boromir was the bulwark of the innocent hobbits against the forces of evil. His sacrifice for them meant that he could never return to protect and save his people and his city, nor could he see the glory of Gondor restored. He died not knowing what would happen to his country, nor would they know what they would do without him. His people would have to find a way forward, for Boromir would give his life to save those that were not as strong nor ferocious in battle as he was. His defense of Merry and Pippin was apology enough for Frodo Shirley, but all who knew Boromir lamented his loss, from Gondor to King Theoden and Rohan to the chieftain of the Dúnedain from the north. Speaking of Gondor and its defense of the west, that would be the next large sacrifice that I would like to mention. To live on the outskirts of evil, and for millennia, to keep a watch on Mordor and its darkness, lest Sauron would ever return, was alike to what the ancient elves did with Morgoth and Beleriand. It was a tiring, thankless duty, put into words beautifully by Boromir in the Fellowship of the Ring movie. By the blood of our people are your lands kept safe. Gondor lost so much and suffered most directly and severely by the military efforts of the forces of Mordor and its other fiefdoms. I believe this is best personified by Faramir specifically, and the actions of his rangers and warriors who lost Athelion despite all of their sacrifices, lost Osgiliath despite their defense, and made it back to Minas Tirith, which was also almost lost, to only be sent back by Stuart Denethor and suffer an immense amount of fatalities. Even if the strategy from command was bad, that does not speak ill of the loyalty and service of the men of Gondor. Faramir and all of his men had honor and loyalty in spite of the horrid commands, that their enemies might be pushed back from their kin and people only a bit more, to give a slight amount more hope to the West. The people born in Gondor did not choose to be the frontline defenders of Middle-earth yet. They were. That was a service given from them to a world that would not all know it. For folk in the Shire, for instance, were given a greater peace through Gondor's sacrifices, though the war came to them eventually. Yet they were not the only country to have their blood spilt for the sake of freedom from Sauron, far from it. Rohan stood shoulder to shoulder with Gondor, first bearing the brunt of Isengard's assaults and Saruman's treachery. 
Even after much of Rohan was devastated by Urukai and Dunlendings, these people pushed on and mustered, journeying south into Gondor, risking the Druidine forest path, and coming to the Pelennor Fields, less than two weeks after the Battle of Helm's Deep, where many Rohirrim perished on the fields beyond the walls of Minas Tirith. In the service of an oath made many centuries before to a neighboring kingdom that stood as the Tower of Guard for the West, Rohan and their king Theoden, whose son and direct heir had already perished, sacrificed even more. That direct line of Eorl ended with Theoden's death upon the field, as might have the entire people of Rohan had Aragorn not come with reinforcements from up the Anduin River. They gave all of this and so much more to hold the ancient alliances, oaths made before any of them were even born, to see the honor of Rohan upheld. If it was to be their end, they would have made such an end to be worthy of song. Thankfully, for the Rohirrim and for all of us readers, it was not so. And though Rohan and Gondor both gave so much in service of Middle-earth, they were vindicated in victory. The next great sacrifice is one that is far more obscure in the background lore in The Lord of the Rings. During the events of the Fellowship of the Ring, we come to find that some sort of dark messenger acting on Sauron's behalf came to Erebor offering the dwarves, specifically King Dane Ironfoot, a choice. If the dwarves could find Bilbo and the Ring of Power, the One Ring, and deliver them to Sauron, they would be given the three remaining dwarven rings of power that were in Sauron's possession, as well as the realm of Moria, their heart's desire to rule and live in forever. Word of such things, rather than the delivery thereof, would obviously see a lesser reward, but if Dane declined altogether, ultimately the North would be invaded, and they would also be the enemies of Sauron. Dane gave them no word, nor aid at all, for finding Bilbo, and in fact would carry this message through glowing to the House of Elrond, which would be discussed before and during the Council. And thus, the North was invaded. Perhaps Sauron's terms were treacherous altogether, and probably they were, or the Three Rings together would have seen the enthrallment or destruction of the Dwarven Kingdom, perhaps there was some sort of catch, or these were the terms that he could not even fulfill at all, but more than that, Erebor opted for the North to be invaded by the Easterlings altogether, rather than see their dear friend Bilbo, who helped in the retaking of the Dwarven Kingdom, turned over to Mordor. They sacrificed Moria for another day, even waiting likely hundreds of years more before they could reclaim it from the goblins, and so on and so forth. All of this to save one little hobbit. Dale was also nearly ruined in the coming battle, and Dane himself was slain. So much blood was spilled, yet Bilbo and the Ring, at least on their behalf, stayed safer for this act of sacrifice. Finally, let's speak of one more act of service and sacrifice, one that made all the difference in the world in The Lord of the Rings, that of Frodo and his bearing of the One Ring. Perhaps this seems too obvious or predictable a choice, too archetypal to speak to such high regards of the main character and the main plot of The Lord of the Rings and the sacrifice made therein, but truly, this was like none other made in all of the history of Arda. Frodo bore this evil artifact, the One Ring, found by his relative, to its doom, and was devastated physically and psychologically in the process. Many speak of Frodo as though he is not the true hero of the Lord of the Rings, and while there are certainly many heroes to be found in Middle-earth, there are none quite like him. While others fought many physical battles, his battle was mostly that of the mind and the evils of the Ring which amplified his own corruption and temptations. Frodo was fighting a completely different war, and one that was inevitable to lose. Many other people, stronger and hardier in every other way, would have been enslaved by the One Ring. But it was Frodo's compassion towards the world, his wisdom, and his will to carry this burden so others did not suffer its ramifications of continued existence, as well as his lack of physical and metaphysical power that actually gave him the strength needed to carry the Ring to its end. Now, he did not destroy the ring in Mount Doom of his own volition, but no one truly could. No one in all of Middle-earth would actually have the willpower to go to Mordor, Mount Doom, and throw the ring in without an issue. He did the closest thing that anyone could do to bring about the ring's end. And every other character, even us readers, would have fallen to the ring's corruption far sooner than Frodo did. 
As Tolkien states in that same letter from the beginning of this video, Frodo did not truly fail, at least not morally. In fact, it was his virtue that came not from the strength of will to destroy the ring, but from his many mercies that saw Gollum survive up to this point that incidentally played the part of destroying the ring. And indeed, all of this was sacrificial and in service of the greater world of Middle-earth, as Frodo was forever scarred, suffering many ailments, physical and mental, at night and in the day, upon the anniversaries of certain horrible events for the rest of his time in Middle-earth, until finally leaving for some peace in Valinor. His valor was certainly of a different kind than many others, but it allowed for one of the greatest sacrifices, if not the greatest, in all of the Lord of the Rings, perhaps all of Tolkien's works. And so, my friends, we come to the end of our tale on the five greatest sacrifices in The Lord of the Rings. From this tale, we see that true honor and moral goodness come in the service of others, in the sacrifice of what we desire to aid the greater world. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this year's Tolkien Reading Day video. Indeed, happy Tolkien Reading Day once more. Here's to the professor. If you did enjoy this video, please leave a like and let me know in the comments below which sacrifice or act of service are you reflecting on today for Tolkien Reading Day? Let me know. And also let me know if you think there was a greatest sacrifice that didn't make its way onto this list. I really tried to think about some of the, the biggest ones that I could, and there are many acts of service and many sacrifices that happen in the lore, but these were the five that really stood out to me. There are so many incredible ones to make mention of from Tolkien's tale. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider getting some candles from our friends Mythology Candles, or order some Weta or United Cutlery Lord of the Rings swords, statues, and other replicas from Castle Khan, who does international shipping and use the code WEST at checkout, and please check out our merch and Patreon. Thanks to our Valor Tier patrons and YouTube members, Peter Shepard, Merton, John Hume, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Reese Jenkins, Arthur Merlin, Dale Davis, Theodore, Moon Viper, Andrew Carlisle, Zumi, and Brian Hunley. Thank you so much to all of our supporters on Patreon and through our YouTube memberships. My friends, please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a special epic character history. Thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.